We are living in the time of the end. The fast fulfilling signs of the times declare that the coming of Christ is near at hand. The days in which we live are solemn and important. The Spirit of God is gradually but surely being withdrawn from the earth. The agencies of evil are combining their forces and consolidating. They are strengthening for the last great crisis. Great changes are soon to take place in our world, and the final movements will be rapid ones. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 9, Page 11. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for the awesome privilege of being in your house of worship on your holy Sabbath. We ask, Father, that as we open your word, that your spirit will hover over its pages and hover over this place, that you will speak directly and personally to each one of us. We realize, Father, that we're living in the last moments of human history, and we are entering very dangerous times in the history of this world. We ask that you will teach us how we can remain firm in the storm that is soon to explode upon the world scene. We thank you for hearing our prayer, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. The title of our study today is Adventism's Trojan Horse. Now, I don't think I have to review the story of Troy and how the city of Troy was actually walled to the heavens, so to speak. A city which was practically invincible, but which eventually fell, not from outward warfare, but from the enemy coming within and leading to the internal fall of that great city of Troy. I believe that the Seventh-day Adventist Church is like that walled city. But I believe that the enemy is also trying to introduce into the Seventh-day Adventist Church a Trojan horse filled with individuals who from within are seeking to undermine and to destroy what God has raised up. And so in our study this morning... I would like to take a look at what is happening within the Seventh-day Adventist Church and what it is that Satan particularly and especially hates about this church which God has chosen to present his end-time message. I'd like to begin by reading a verse which all of us, or probably most of us at least, are acquainted with. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 17. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 17. Obviously this verse comes at the very end of the chapter. And it's talking about the end time remnant which will live in this world before the second coming of Jesus. And it says this, and I'm reading from the King James Version. And the dragon was wroth with the woman. The, dev the dragon represents Satan. The dragon was wroth with the woman, that is with the church, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed. In other words, the last remaining portion of her seed, the end time remnant, if you please. Now you'll notice that there are two things that the dragon or the devil hates about this remnant. We are told in the last part of the verse, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Two things which the devil hates about the end time remnant church. Number one, they keep the commandments of God. And number two, they have 
the testimony of Jesus Christ. These will be the two targets of the devil's warfare in the end of time. The law and the testimony of Jesus. Now perhaps I wouldn't need to read it, but I would like to anyway. What is the testimony of Jesus? Revelation chapter 19 and verse 10 defines the testimony of Jesus. We're told there in Revelation 19 and verse 10, And I fell at the feet or at his feet, that is of an angel, to worship him. But he said to me, See that you do not do that. I am your fellow servant and of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. What is the testimony of Jesus? It is the spirit of of prophecy. And you'll notice that this verse says that the brothers of John have the testimony of Jesus. Now go with me to Revelation 22 and verses 8 and 9. Revelation 22 and verses 8 and 9. Once again, the same idea. An angel appears to John and John feels the urge to worship him. It says in verse 8, Now I, John, saw and heard these things. And when I heard and saw, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel who showed me these things. Then he said to me, See that you do not do that, for I am your fellow servant and your brethren the prophets. And of those who keep the words of this book, worship God. Now, if you compare Revelation 19.10 and 22 verse 9, we find something very interesting. In Revelation 19, verse 10, we are told that the brethren of John have the testimony of Jesus, which is the spirit of prophecy. In Revelation 22 and verse 9, we're told that the brethren of John are prophets. I don't know whether you caught that. But really, the brethren of John have the testimony of Jesus. The brethren of John are prophets. In other words, the two things which the devil is going to hate about the end time remnant is, first of all, they keep the commandments of God, they keep the law of God, and secondly, they have the testimony of Jesus, which is the gift of prophecy. Now, we usually think of the end-time warfare against the church as a warfare of unbelievers against believers. Those who are outside warring against those who are inside the church. But as I look at Scripture... I find that the greatest enemies of God's people in the course of human history have come not from without, but from within. That's why the spirit of prophecy tells us that we have much more to fear from those who are within than from those who are without. Let me just review some biblical examples as to the dangers within. The Trojan horse, if you please. We have the story of Cain and Abel. Cain was a believer. He raised up an altar. He worshipped God. He brought an offering. Even though it wasn't the offering that God had asked for, he was religious. And yet the Bible tells us that Cain arose, the believer arose, and he killed his very own brother. You look at the story of the prophets in the Old Testament. Every single one of the prophets was despised by the very people that they were sent to witness to. In other words, their enemies were not the Philistines, the Babylonians, the Egyptians, or other nations from outside Israel. The greatest enemies of the prophets were found within the holy community, within those who claimed to be the people of God. We could talk about Jesus. He was betrayed by one of his own disciples who was within the inner circle of the disciples. Jesus was delivered to the, to the Romans for crucifixion by the very people that he came to this world to save. In other words, the enemies of Jesus were not the Romans, were not outsiders. The enemies of Jesus were those within the covenant community, within the inner circle. 
Time and again in the New Testament we find this idea of the enemy within. That the primary danger for God's people is not from outsiders but from insiders. Allow me to read you some passages from the writings of the New Testament authors other than Jesus on this phenomenon of danger from within. Acts chapter 20 verses 29 and 30. Here the Apostle Paul is speaking to the elders at Ephesus. He's about to leave. And notice what he says there in Acts 20, verses 29 and 30. He says, For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. And now notice what he says. Also of your own selves shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw disciples after them. Notice, from among your own selves, from among the elders, the Apostle Paul is saying here, in Ephesus will arise a group who will speak perverse things and draw disciples after them. Second Timothy chapter 3, verses 1-5, through 5, very well known passage. It is a catalog of end time sins. The Apostle Paul says this, This also know, that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. And you say, well, that's speaking about the people outside the church. That's speaking about worldlings. If you think that, think again. Because the last part of verse 5 says, having a what? A form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. A group practicing this catalog of sins who have the form of godliness but lack the power of godliness. This must be a group of people which we would call the enemy within. Notice also 2 Peter chapter 2 and verses 1 and 2. 2 Peter chapter 2 and verses 1 and 2. It says, but there were false prophets also among the people. Did you catch that? There were also false prophets among the people. Even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privately shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. Once again, the idea from within the covenant circle, within the church, arising groups of individuals who will teach damnable heresy, who will lead people within the church astray from the truth of God. Another example is 1 John chapter 2 and verses 18 and 19, where we find John, who is writing probably around the same time that the book of Revelation was written, saying these words, Little children, it is the last time. And as ye have heard, that Antichrist shall come. Even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. Now notice this. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would not, no doubt, have continued with us. But they went out, that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. Notice that they belonged to the circle of the believers, but they went out, they left the way of the truth. Not only then do we find in the story of Cain and Abel, in the story of the prophets, in the story of Jesus that the primary enemy was within. We find it also in apostolic times, where they speak about what's going to happen at the end of time. We could talk about the Middle Ages. It's interesting, the greatest enemies of God's people during the Middle Ages was a church that claimed to be the true church of Jesus Christ on earth. 
they rounded up God's people and they slew them by the millions, believing that they were doing the will of God. In other words, it was a case of Christians killing other Christians during the Middle Ages. That's a lot closer than biblical times. The final Antichrist will be like Judas, according to Scripture. He's not going to be some outsider who is going to blaspheme openly the God of heaven. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 calls him the son of perdition, the very name which was given to Judas. In other words, the end time Antichrist is going to be like Judas. He's going to be a member of the Christian inner circle. He's not going to be an unbeliever. He is going to be a believer and his system will be a system of believers. In fact, in the very end time, if you go with me to John chapter 16 and verses 1 and 2, those who believe that they're following true religion will actually think that they're doing God a favor by persecuting His people. It says in John chapter 16 and verses 1 and 2, These things, Jesus is speaking, I have spoken to you that you should not be made to stumble. They will put you out of the synagogues. They must be religious people if they're going to cast them out of the synagogues. Today we would call them churches. Yes, the time is coming that whoever kills you will think that he offers God a service. So I believe that in the end time, there is going to be a Trojan horse within the Seventh-day Adventist church. And our greatest enemies are not the beast. And the false prophet, although they are real enemies, and in this series we're going to talk about them, but our greatest enemies are to be found within our own hearts, first of all, our own sinful hearts, but also by individuals within the church who claim to be followers of Jesus, but are really not. We are really repeating the history of ancient Israel. Do you know that every time that Israel murmured and complained against God, it was caused by a group which is known as the mixed multitude? There were individuals who joined Israel to escape the plagues of Egypt. Not because their heart was with Israel, but because they wanted to be blessed with Israel. And because they wanted to escape the judgments upon Egypt, they joined Israel. And they were the cause of one problem after another. Every single murmuring that came up in Israel was called by the, caused by the mixed multitude who were with Israel but did not truly belong to Israel. Is it really going to be any different in the end time? Absolutely not. Now the primary passage that I would like us to look at in our study today is found in Matthew chapter 7. Following the same theme of end-time Christians claiming to serve God, end-time Adventists claiming to serve God, but at the same time not truly serving God, is found especially in this passage that we're going to analyze. Matthew chapter 7, and I would like to begin reading at verse 15. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 15. Notice carefully what Jesus says. Beware of false prophets. Does that have anything to do with Revelation 12, 17? Uh, I, I, I want you to notice the connection. Beware of false prophets, which come to you in what? Sheep's clothing. Could we say sheepskins? Do you think? Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Now let me ask you, what did the skins represent that God used to clothe Adam and Eve after they sinned? Two lambs were slain. God took the skins and he covered the nakedness of Adam and Eve. By that method, God was showing that he was covering the unrighteousness of Adam and Eve with the spotless righteousness of Jesus. Now, if these false prophets are clothed in sheepskins, it must mean that they claim to follow whom? That they claim to follow Jesus. And they must claim to have the righteousness of Jesus in their lives. 
Because they're covered with the skins of the Lamb. And the Lamb represents whom? The Lamb represents Jesus. These are not unbelievers. They are what? They are believers. But there's a contradiction between the outward profession and the inward condition. Now let's continue to verse 16. How can we detect that these are wolves and not truly followers of Jesus who are covered with His righteousness? How can you tell? They say they're Christians. They probably come to church. They go through all of the religious ceremonies. But there's something wrong. How can we detect the fact that even though they're covered supposedly with the skins of lambs, which represents what? The righteousness of Christ, that they're really not that at all. We find the answer starting with verse 16. It says, Ye shall know them by their faith. What does it say? You shall know them by their what? By their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns? Or figs of thistles? Any of you ever gathered grapes from thorns? Pastor Jensen gave me some figs this morning. Did you get those from thistles? I don't think so. He got them from a fig tree. Even so, every good tree bringeth forth what? Good fruit. But a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. Let me ask you, is the problem with the fruit or is the problem with the tree? You tell me, is the problem with the fruit or with the tree? The problem is with the tree. The problem is not with the fruit, it's with the tree. If the tree is right, the fruit is right. But with these false prophets, the fruit is what? Wrong. They claim to come from a good tree, but their fruits reveal that there's something wrong with the nature of the tree. Or with their sinful nature, if you please. It continues saying, A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit. So if somebody tells you that he's a follower of Jesus and lives like the devil, you have reason to wonder. A good tree, bring, a good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. And then we have the repetition of the same thought with which this passage began. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall what? Ye shall know them. Now the question is, what is meant by the fruits? What are these fruits where you can distinguish false prophets from true prophets? Where you can distinguish the, the true from the counterfeit? What are these fruits? Well, we're all acquainted with the passage in Galatians chapter 5, where it speaks about the fruit of the Spirit. But do you know that the, the opposite side of the fruit of the Spirit is called the works of the what? The works of the flesh. In other words, the, the fruits that Jesus is talking about, by their fruits ye shall know them, is really the same as the works of the flesh or the fruit of the Spirit. Now let's notice what those works of the flesh are because these individuals, they claim to be followers of Jesus. They claim to be covered with the righteousness of Christ. They claim to be Christians according to this passage. But they have a fruit problem which means that they have a tree problem. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Now notice Galatians 5 verses 19 to 21. We're talking about the fruits or the works of the flesh. Same thing. The evil fruits of these who claim to follow Jesus. And in Galatians chapter 5, it's called the works of the flesh. By the way, the flesh is the bad tree. The life that is controlled by the Holy Spirit produces the fruit of the Spirit. The life which is controlled by the flesh produces the works of the flesh. Notice what the Apostle Paul says in Galatians 5.19. Now the works of the flesh are manifest. Remember, these are the fruits of these false prophets. Which are these? Adultery. Fornication. By the way, this applies to whether, uh, you know, whether you actually commit adultery or you commit adultery in your mind. 
You know, one of the huge problems in the world today is the problem of pornography. Big problem. Even among ministers. It's amazing. So it says, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. That's a word that means lewdness. Idolatry, witchcraft. By the way, the word in Greek is pharmakeia, where we get the word pharmacy from. Say, so what, what relationship is there? Well, the fact is that those who practice spiritualism usually took uh, substances to, to get them high in order to practice their witchcraft. That is in ancient times. He continues saying, hatred. Variance, that means discord. Emulations, jealousy in other words. Wrath, fits of rage. Strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings. That's referring to party animals. It's the word orgies really what it means. And he hasn't given us a complete, complete list because he says, and such like. Now this is only a partial list, the Apostle Paul says, of the works of the flesh. He says, of which I tell you before, as also I have told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. I want you to remember that expression. Those who do these things cannot inherit the kingdom of God. What are these false prophets doing? They're producing what? They're producing evil fruit. Although they claim to be a good tree. And what are the fruits? The fruits are these works of the flesh. The same ideas that we find in 2 Timothy chapter 3, where we gave that long catalog of sins, of those who have the form of godliness, but are lacking the power of godliness in their lives. Now let's go to Matthew 7 and verse 21, continuing this passage. Listen to what these false prophets are like. They're a bad tree, and they produce bad fruit. But they want to make themselves look like a what? Like a good tree, but they can't because the fruit is what? Evil. Notice verse 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord. Are these the ones who have the form of godliness? Yes? Are these the ones who are covered with, with the skins of a sheep? In sheep's clothing? Yes. Do they say, Lord, Lord? Oh, absolutely. They come to church. They sing the hymns. But there's something wrong with the tree. There's something wrong with the heart. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord. By the way, are these Christians? Why would they be calling Jesus Lord, Lord, if they weren't Christians? Can you detect the sense of urgency? Lord, Lord. By the way, in the Greek, it's called in the, it's in the vocative case, which, which means that it's an expression of surprise. Lord, Lord. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. Is that similar to what the Apostle Paul said in the text that we just read? That those who do these things shall not what? Inherit the kingdom of God. Now Jesus says, not the one who says, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that what? That doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. So what does it mean to produce good fruit? It means that you what? You do the will of the Father in heaven. The false prophets say, Lord, Lord, but their lives deny their profession. You look at their life, and their life contradicts what they profess to be, according to this. Now notice verse 22. Many will say to me in that day. Which day is that, by the way? 
What did the previous verse say? Let's notice. It says, Not everyone who saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. So which is the day? The day when we're going to what? Enter the kingdom of heaven. Did you get that point? So many will say to me in that day, that is the day when we're going to enter the kingdom of heaven. Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? Are these Christians? Did they profess to be Christians? Yes or no? Come on, you can answer. Did they profess to be Christians? If they didn't profess to be Christians, why would they be invoking the name of Jesus? Many will say to me in that day, that is the day when it comes to, to the point of entering the kingdom, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils? And in thy name done many wonderful works? Did they have apparently the gifts of the Holy Spirit? Let me ask you, is prophecy one of the gifts of the Spirit? In 1 Corinthians chapter 12? Yes. How about uh, <clears throat> casting out demons? Is that one of the gifts of the Spirit? How about miracles? Is that one of the gifts of the Spirit? So let me ask you, did these people apparently have the gifts of the Holy Spirit? Yes, they did. They had signs and wonders. They prophesied. They cast out devils. They perform many miracles. And so you say, they had to belong to Jesus because they're using His name and they're performing works that appear to be the work of the Holy Spirit. But is it so? Are there going to be counterfeit gifts of the Holy Spirit at the end of time? Performed by people who claim to follow Jesus but really are not with Him. You know, this should lead us to think about what many have and say, oh, you know, why can't we be like the other churches? They have healings and they speak in tongues and they get all excited and they, they dance in the aisles and they jump around, they show enthusiasm. Listen, folks, none of that is proof that it is of God. Because this passage tells us that, it, that this group claims the name of Jesus. They actually prophesy, they actually cast out demons and they actually perform miracles. But they are not gifts of God's Spirit. You say, how do you know that? Maybe they were with God, and then they ended up, and when they did the miracles and the signs, they were with God, and then they went astray. Not so. They weren't with God when they were performing the acts. And you say, how do we know that? Notice what we find uh, in verse 23. It says, and then I will profess unto them. This is Jesus speaking. I what? I can't hear you. I what? I never knew you. So were they once with God? And they did these signs and wonders when they were with God and then they went astray? Uh-uh. Because Jesus says, I never what? I never knew you. Now allow me to ask this question. When is this scene going to take place? When this group of people are going to be saying, Lord, Lord, with a sense of urgency, didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we cast out demons in your name? Didn't we do many wonders? Didn't we perform miracles in your name? When is it that they're going to do this? Actually, it's going to take place after the millennium. You say, what? After the millennium? Yes. After the millennium, all of the wicked are going to resurrect. And among the wicked are going to be those who profess to follow Jesus. But whose heart and whose actions were wrong. Wow, you say, how's that? Allow me to read you a statement that we find in the book Spiritual Gifts. Volume 3, page 86. Do you know that those people outside the city are actually going to uh, complain to God and say, Hey, what are we doing out here? We're supposed to be inside, not out here. We did all of these things in your name. We were yours. Notice what she says, what Ellen White says here. And then I'm going to prove it from Scripture. She says, speaking about after the millennium, then many who had professed to be Christ's followers 
but who had not honored God in their lives. I'll let that sink in. Then many of those who had professed to be Christ followers, but who had not honored God in their lives. What is the fruit? The life. The life led by God's Spirit. She says, they enumerate their good deeds. See, they have a good memory. They say, we did this, we did this, we did this, we did this, and we did this. They enumerate their good deeds performed when they lived upon the earth and entreat to be admitted into the city. You can hear it. Lord, Lord, we should be inside. They plead that their names were upon the church books. Hello? Fresno Central's church books? Perhaps. I would pray to God that no, nobody from Fresno Central would be in this category. They plead that their names were upon the church books. And they had prophesied in the name of Christ. And in His name cast out devils. And done many wonderful works. Christ answers, Your cases have been decided. Your names are not found enrolled in the book of life. You professed to believe in my name. And now I want you to notice something very important. She says, you profess to believe in my name, but you trampled upon the law of God. By the way, is there any relationship between this and Revelation 12, 17? What does the devil hate in the end time? Commandments of God and the gift of prophecy. Are there going to be many false prophets in the end of time? Even who claim to follow Jesus? Yes, but what is their life characterized by? They trample on God's what? God's law. So the end time scenario is of those who have the true gift of prophecy and keep the law and those who are false prophets and claim to serve Jesus but trample on the law of God. And now we need to go to a very important point that will connect Matthew 7 with Revelation 12, 17. Notice Matthew 7 and verse 23. And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity, it says in the old King James Version. Not the best translation. I love the King James. Don't get me wrong. But most modern versions translate it differently. It's the Greek word anomias. See, in Greek the word nomos means law. When you put the letter A next to that word, it means against. See, have Christ, Antichrist. Same basic idea. So, Anomias means those who are contrary to the law. Or it says here, those who practice what? Lawlessness. The works of the flesh. The fruits of a bad tree. They claim to follow Jesus. But they are a Trojan horse inside the Christian church. Which lay, lead many people astray. So let me ask you, do the false prophets of Matthew chapter 7... Practice lawlessness? Sure. So does this have any relationship with Revelation 12, 17? You have two opposite ends of the spectrum. Revelation 12, 17 speaks about those who keep the law and have the gift of prophecy, the true gift of prophecy. Matthew 7 is speaking about many in the end time who say, Lord, Lord, but they are really false prophets and they trample upon what? They trample upon the law of God. Now allow me to tell you something about this word anomias. Lawlessness. Do you know it's the very word that's used in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 4, that famous verse that uh, Adventists know all about. We can recite from memory. Whosoever therefore sins, does what? Transgresses also the law. For sin is what? Transgression of the law. Do you know that that expression, transgression of the law, 
in the Greek is the word anomias. Notice that the King James doesn't translate it. Sin is iniquity, which is the translation it provides in Matthew 7. It translates sin as transgression of the law, and that is the correct translation. And the King James has it right in 1 John 3, verse 4. So sin is what? The transgression of the law. So in Matthew chapter 7, those who practice anomias are those who transgress what? Who transgress the law. And incidentally, what Ellen White says about this group and when they live is very fully corroborated by Scripture. Matthew chapter 25, which we studied several months ago, do you remember when the sheep and the goats are gathered before the, the throne of Jesus and he separates the sheep and the goats? And he says to the sheep, come and inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, you gave me to eat, and so on. And they say to Jesus, well, you know, when did we see you that way? Well, in that you have done it unto one of these, the least of the brethren, you have done it unto me. And then you have the other group, the goats. Jesus says, you know, I was hungry, you didn't give me to eat. And they say, now wait a minute, Lord, we're on your side. When did we see you that way? By the way, this scene is also presented in Revelation chapter 20, 11 through 15, when all of the wicked are gathered outside the holy city, and the record of their lives is going to be opened. And there will be many on the outside who feel that they have the right to be on the inside. Time and again, folks, in Scripture, you have a connection between the law and the true gift of prophecy. Because the true prophet brings people back to an observance of the law of God. Not because they have to, but because the tree is right. See, they preach for the tree to get right so that the life will be right. Allow me to read you some of those passages from Scripture where the law and the prophet, the law and the gift of prophecy are linked. Notice Jeremiah 23 and verses 21 and 22. Jeremiah chapter 23 and verses 21 and 22. God is complaining about Israel and he says this. I have not sent these prophets. These are false prophets. I have not sent these prophets, yet they ran. I have not spoken to them, yet they prophesied. But if they had stood in my counsel and had caused my people to hear my words, what does the true prophet, what is he supposed to do? He's supposed to lead people to what? To hear God's words. Then... They should have turned them from their what? From their evil way and from the evil of their doings. What do two prophets do? They speak for God and they turn people away from what? Away, away from wickedness. By the way, that's the reason why people didn't like prophets. Could you mention one prophet in the Bible who was popular? None of them could have won a popularity contest, I can assure you that. Because the, uh, the living place of prophets was in the dungeon or with their head cut off. Because they were hated. Do you know why they were hated? Because they, got, they called God's people to forsake their evil ways and to be obedient unto God. Is it going to be any different in the end time? What would we expect the true prophet to preach? Smooth things? Nice things? Or things that will lead us to put our lives in order with God's holy word and with God's holy law? Notice Jeremiah chapter 26 and verses 4 through 6. Jeremiah 26 and verses 4 through 6. Once again, the idea of prophecy and the law are linked together. And thou shalt say unto them, Thus saith the Lord, If ye will not hearken to me, to walk in my what? To walk in my law, which I have set before you, to hearken to the words of my servants, the what? Do you see the connection once again? What do prophets do? They preach what? God's law. He says, Whom I have sent unto you, both rising up early and sending them, but ye have not hearkened. Then will I make this house like Shiloh and will make this city a curse to all the nations of the earth. Once again, the prophet is called to call God's people back 
to ob the observance of God's holy law, not because they have to, but because the tree is right. Is that the characteristic that we find in Revelation 12, 17 about the end time remnant? They have the gift of prophecy and they keep what? The commandments of God. Notice Nehemiah 9 and verse 26. Nehemiah chapter 9 and verse 26. The same idea, the law and the prophets coming together. It says there, nevertheless they were disobedient and rebelled against thee and cast thy what? There it is again. Cast thy law behind their backs and slew thy, there it is, law and prophets and slew thy prophets which testified against them to turn them to thee and they wrought great provocation. Perhaps one more in the Old Testament. Zechariah chapter 7 and verse 12. Zechariah chapter 7 and verse 12. God is complaining to Israel. He says, Yea, they made their hearts as an adamant stone, lest they should hear the law. There it is again. Lest they should hear the law and the words which the Lord of hosts has sent in His Spirit. By whom? By the former prophets. Therefore came a great wrath from the Lord of hosts. Time and again, folks, Revelation 12, 17 is not the first or the last time. Time and again in Scripture, the true prophet is the prophet that calls God's people back to an observance of God's holy law out of love for God. Let's notice one New Testament reference other than the one in Matthew chapter 7. We find in Matthew 24, verses 11 and 12, the chapter that speaks about the signs of the second coming of Christ. Here Jesus says, and many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. What will, what will they deceive people to do? Let's continue reading. And because, what's the next word? Are you with me in Matthew 24 verse 11? And because what? Lawlessness, say the modern versions, the King James says iniquity, and because lawlessness shall abound, the love of many shall wax or shall grow, grow cold. To what is this lawlessness due? The previous verse says that it's because of the work of whom? Of the false prophets. Many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. And as a result it says because iniquity or anomias shall abound. The love of many shall wax cold. Now we need to move on quickly. Go with me to Matthew chapter 7 and verse 24. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 24. Have you caught the picture of what God is trying to say? There's going to be two groups in the end time. What are the two groups? Those who profess to follow Jesus, they keep His law, and they have the gift of prophecy. You have another group who pro profess to follow Jesus, they're called what kind of prophet? False prophets, and they trample upon God's law. Those are the two groups. Now let me ask you, in the end time crisis, which of these two groups is going to remain firm and is going to be faithful till the end? That's a rhetorical question, because we all know. Now, Jesus is going to illustrate the two groups and he's going to explain what characterizes each. Notice Matthew chapter 7 and verse 24. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them. Are you catching the connection with what was said previously? Those who have sheep's clothing, what kind of, what kind of Christian are they? They're, they're what? Hearers, but not what? Not doers. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. Who are those who build upon the rock? Those who hear what? The words of Jesus, and those who do them. Let me ask you, do the true prophets speak the words of Jesus? Do the true prophets, when they speak the words of Jesus, call God's people back to an observance of His law? 
Yes, they, yes, they do. By the previous context, we know that these are true prophets who are calling God's people to do the will of Jesus, which is revealed in His law. And so it says, Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. So to build upon the rock means to listen to the voice of the prophets calling God's people to observe the holy law of God. Not hearers, but doers. And now notice. And the rain descended and the floods came. Let me ask you, is there a flood coming upon this world? The book of Revelation calls it the river Euphrates. A flood, a multitude of individuals persecuting God's people. Because the waters represent multitudes, nations, tongues, and peoples. Is there a time, notice the passage continues saying, and the winds blew. Is there a time when the winds are going to be released according to the book of Revelation? Winds of strife such as never has been seen. Yes, this is talking about the time of trouble, folks. The floods are in Revelation chapter 16. The winds are in Revelation chapter 7. And what happens to those who hear the words of Jesus? They listen to the voice of the, pro of the true prophet. And they obey God's holy law. It says that the floods came, the winds blew, and beat upon that house. Notice the house was not spared the tribulation. <laughs> but it may, remained firm in the midst of the tribulation. The last part says, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. A more accurate translation is, for it had been founded upon the rock. Is there a difference? What, the, what does that indicate? For it had been founded upon the rock. It means that it was founded upon the rock before the winds and the floods came. And what does it mean to build on the rock? It means to listen to the voice of Jesus as found in the law and in his prophets. The people who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. But there's another group. They're found in verses 26 and 27. Jesus says, And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not. Is this the same group that were covered by the sheepskins? Yeah? The ones who said, Lord, Lord? The ones who cast out demons? And prophesied in the name of Jesus? And performed many miracles? In the context, are these the ones? Yes, they are. Everyone that heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them not, shall be likened unto a what? A foolish man. You know, I, I hesitate in saying this, but do you know what the word is in Greek for foolish? It's the word moron. I kid you not. It's the Greek word moron. So it could be translated, shall be likened unto a moron. Whoever builds upon the sand. It says, which built his house upon the sand. What does it mean to build upon the sand? It means to hear the words of Jesus and what? And not do them. And who speaks the words of Jesus? Do the prophets? The prophets? Does the law? Yes? So who are reckoned with the morons, if you please? I know it's not a very nice word, but I'm just telling you what the Greek word is. They are those who build their house upon the sand, they hear the words of Jesus, but they say, we're not going to do it. And what happens to them? It says, when the tribulation comes, when the floods, when the multitudes overwhelm the world and persecution comes, when the winds of strife are released, we're told the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house. And it what? And it fell. And great was the fall of it. So what do we need to do? We need to build upon the rock. Which means listening to the voice of the prophet. And listening to what God says in His holy law. 
Now, folks, you've probably been able to observe that there is great fermentation at present in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, doctrinally speaking. And you know, I made a list of the conflicts that have come into the Adventist Church since the, since the middle 70s. I want to share some of those with you. Do you know that every single one of these things, these points of conflict, can be boiled down to two issues? Number one, the gift of prophecy, and number two, God's holy law. Because the devil hates the law, and he hates the gift of prophecy. And every single one of these conflicts has something to do with the gift of prophecy and something to do with the law of God. Allow me just to mention here a few of these. In the 1970s, there was this big debate about perfection. Is it possible to live a perfect life before Jesus comes. And you constantly hear ministers say, no, it's, Im Im it's impossible to be perfect in this life. Let me tell you what. We would have to understand then why Jesus said, be ye therefore perfect, although you can't be. Is that what he says? Be ye therefore perfect, although you can't be, even as your heavenly Father is perfect. Not what it says. Why would the Apostle Paul say, I can do some things through Christ who strengthens me? I can do most things through Christ. No. He says, I can do all things except overcome sin through Christ who strengthens me. No. To he who is able to keep you from falling. It says in Jude 24 and 25. Saying that you cannot live a life in perfect harmony with the law of God through the power of the Holy Spirit is an is an indirect attack against the law of God. There's been this big debate about the nature of Christ. Some people say Jesus took the nature of Christ before, before the fall, the nature of Adam before the fall. If that's the case, Jesus had a, diff had a different nature than I do. He overcame in a sinless nature, whereas I have to overcome in a sinful nature. It separates Jesus from me. And it actually gives an excuse for saying, well, I can't overcame as Jesus overcame because he had a superior nature to mine. Once again, it boils down to whether man can keep God's holy law in sinful flesh. Some people say you're supposed to celebrate the feast days. We have some nearby. Right over in Squaw Valley. Not everybody, by the way, who lives in Squaw Valley. Do you know that this is really an indirect attack against God's holy Sabbath? Listen, we have enough trouble getting people to keep the Sabbath. If you stop preaching the Hebrew feasts, people say these people are really loony. And they'll throw out the Sabbath with the feasts and everything else. The devil wants to overburden and overload people so that people will reject the baby with the bathwater, if you please. I've been corresponding with an individual who's been trying to convince me that Jesus was crucified on Wednesday and resurrected on Sabbath. He says, the reason why I do that is because that way I can prove to Christians that Jesus didn't resurrect on Sunday and they no longer have any reason to keep Sunday. But what he ignores is the fact that Jesus rested in the tomb on the Sabbath as he rested from creation on the Sabbath. So it's an indirect attack against God's holy Sabbath. You have one of our theologians saying that the little horn is Islam. If that's true, then the papacy had nothing to do with the change of the Sabbath. We're to look to the Middle East for the person who changed the times and the laws. Once again, it's trying to, to hide the power that sought to change God's holy Sabbath. And then you have some Adventist scholars who are teaching the Middle Eastern scenario of Bible prophecy. Saying that perhaps prophecy is going to be fulfilled in the Middle East with the rebuilt temple over there. Some Adventist scholars are starting to say that. 
Some Adventist evangelists are starting to say that. Because they see Islam playing a big role in prophecy. They're in the news all the time. So they say they have to be in the Bible somewhere. Listen, folks, if this is true, that it's Islam who's going to be the enemy, then the final conflict is not going to be over worship and over the Sabbath. If you look into the Middle East. There are Adventists who are presently attacking the doctrine of the Trinity. I won't get into how that is a direct onslaught against God's holy law. Because the Trinity was involved in the giving of the law. The Father spoke, Jesus spoke, the Spirit wrote in letters of fire. Somebody was trying to convince me that we need to begin the Sabbath by Jerusalem time. That means that if you believe, begin this, to keep the Sabbath at Jerusalem time, you're actually breaking some of the hours of the Sabbath. Another person says you're supposed to observe the Sabbath by a lunar calendar. Do you know what that means? It means that the Sabbath falls on a different day every week. What is the devil doing? It's an attack against what? Sabbath. The biblical Sabbath, because he hates the Sabbath. We have scholars in our midst. One individual who died already. And there's others in our institutions who are teaching something that is known as progressive creation. The idea that God used evolution as his method of creation. In other words, there was death for millions of years before sin. God didn't create this world in six literal days according to this concept. He used long millions of, uh, of years, of ages to create this world through the process of evolution. Let me ask you, if the days of creation are long periods of time, what happens with the Sabbath? It's gone. The devil hates the Sabbath. I better not get into women's ordination. Who said that? Attacks on our sanctuary doctrine. Which, which, by the way, the essence of the sanctuary doctrine is that all sin needs to be confessed and conquered and placed in the sanctuary. And Jesus is going to take it out of the sanctuary. It has to do with, with overcoming sin in the life and receiving full forgiveness for sin. And sin is transgression of the law. So an attack on the sanctuary is an attack on the law and an attack on the Sabbath. And need I say it's an attack on Ellen White who is absolutely clear on that issue. By the way, Ellen White is clear on all of these. So if you, if you say that you're supposed to keep the Sabbath by Jerusalem time, or Jesus was crucified on Wednesday and resurrected on Sabbath, that you're supposed to keep the Sabbath by a lunar calendar, that the Trinity isn't true, that, that uh, prophecy will be fulfilled according to a Middle East scenario, you have to totally disbelieve everything Ellen White says. So it's not only a matter of the Sabbath and the law, it's a matter having to do with Ellen White and the gift of prophecy. And then you have, you know, you have attacks against the sanctuary by individuals like Desmond Ford, Raymond Cottrell, one of the editors of the Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary in 1952. His last couple of years before life, his main mission was to totally try and obliterate the sanctuary doctrine that the Seventh-day Adventist Church holds on a biblical basis. And then you have direct attacks against Ellen White by individuals like Walter Ray, the white lie. Ronald Numbers, Ellen White, prophetess of health. Many websites which bring up issues, which when you really study them carefully, they're not actually issues. And then you have conflicts in the Adventist church on lifestyle issues, music, congregationalism. I've never been able to understand why, for example, the issue of jewelry is even an issue. If I might be somewhat bold. Is it clearly revealed in the Bible in the spirit of prophecy? Yes, it is. So if we listen to the Bible in the spirit of prophecy, will we dress the way God says we're supposed to dress if we love Jesus? Certainly. It's a no-brainer. There's even use of the historical critical method in our institutions of learning. It was formerly called higher criticism. 
Folks, every single one of the conflicts in the Seventh-day Adventist Church within the church, not warring from outside, but inside the church, can be boiled down to an attack on the law, the Sabbath, and the spirit of prophecy. And I meant, might mention one individual by name, Dale Retzler. Used to be a teacher at Monterey Bay Academy. The unbelievable has happened. His one mission in life is to annihilate the Seventh-day Adventist Church. He publishes a magazine called Proclamation. And the interesting thing is, this individual who used to be a Seventh-day Adventist, in the issues that I've gotten of the, book, of the journal Proclamation, his attack has been against the law, the Sabbath, the spirit of prophecy, health principles, the sanctuary, and recently the state of the dead doctrine. And yet if I read the letters to the editor that people send him, there's letters purportedly from Seventh-day Adventist pastors and from Seventh-day Adventists who are saying, praise the Lord for your publication. I'm so thankful that I've been delivered. Delivered from what is my question. You know, Ellen White prophesied that this was going to happen a long time ago. Allow me to read you a statement from Great Controversy, page 608, and then uh, I want to read just a statement uh, or a passage from a former president of the General Conference who predicted that what we're seeing in the church was going to happen. Ellen White says in Great Controversy, page 608, this, as the storm approaches, by the way, storms bring waters and winds. Hello. As the storm approaches, a large class who have professed faith in the third angel's message, but have not been sanctified through obedience to the truth. Is this Matthew 7? Yes. Who have professed, she says, who have professed faith in the third angel's message, but have not been sanctified through obedience to the truth, abandoned their position and joined the ranks of the opposition. By uniting with the world and partaking of its spirit, they have come to view matters in nearly the same light, and when the test is brought, they are prepared to choose the easy popular side. Men of talent and pleasing address, who once rejoiced in the truth, employ their power to deceive and mislead souls. They become the most bitter enemies of their former brethren. When Sabbath keepers are brought before the courts to answer for their faith, these apostates are the most efficient agents of Satan to misrepresent and accuse them, and by false reports and insinuations to stir up the rulers against them. The day is coming when those who walk with us will become the greatest enemies of God's people. They will be like Judas in the camp. You say, why would I we don't want to belong to a church that has so much turmoil if there's any visitors here? Why, why would I want to belong to the Seventh-day Adventist church that has so much turmoil within it? Well, the fact that the turmoil exists, I say, praise the Lord, because it shows me that the devil is worried. If everything was fine, I'd say, well, uh, you know, everything is okay. On the surface, then I would say, the devil's not too worried. But the devil is worried about this church. And the spirit of prophecy says that it might appear like it's going to fall, but it's not going to fall. So you stick with the ship. Yeah, the, the ship has hit bumpy waters. There are lots of icebergs out there. But the ship is going to get to the port with or without it. I would pray that it would get there with us. Even though this is a little bit long, if you'll permit me to indulge in reading this. This is the final address of the President Robert Pearson to the General Conference um, in Autumn Council, and also the employees of the, of the Review and Herald were there, as well as the members of the General Conference Committee. This was his last address to the world church before he retired. By the way, Robert Pearson was a very pious spiritual man. Tremendous. I have a friend who works in San Francisco, Antonio Rodriguez, who used to
be in charge of cleaning the general conference office. And he says that sometimes he would arrive at 4 o'clock in the morning to clean, and Pastor Pearson would come, and he would spend from 4 till the time that they began work praying in his office. Very spiritual man, despised by many, incidentally. I believe that they actually made him sick because of what he saw coming into the church. And he tried to stand firm for principle. Now, folks, I'm going to have to do something. You might want to write down this date. The first date that Pastor Bohr used glasses. <laughs> because the print of this is awful small. So, Wendy, I've made your date. This is what, uh, somebody, I look like a scholar, right? This is what he says. This will be the last time that in my present role I shall stand before the world leaders of my church, your church, our church, and I have a few words to leave with you. I take my thoughts from something that Elder and Mrs. Ralph Neal have written describing how typically a sect evolves into a church. They say a sect is often begun by a charismatic leader with tremendous drive and commitment, and that it arises as a protest against worldliness and formalism in a church. It is generally embraced by the poor. The rich would lose too much by joining it, since it is unpopular, despised, and persecuted by society in general. It has definite beliefs firmly held by zealous members. Each member makes a personal decision to join it and knows what he believes. There is little organization or property, and there are few buildings. The group has strict standards and control on behavior. Preachers, often without education, arise by inner compulsion. There is little concern about public relations. That's the origin of a movement. And then it passes to the second generation. With growth, there comes a need for organization and buildings. As a result of industry and frugality, members become prosperous. As prosperity increases, persecution begins to wane. Children born into the movement do not have to make personal decisions to join it. They do not necessarily know what they believe. They do not need to hammer out their own positions. These have been worked out for them. Preachers arise more by selection and by apprenticeship to older workers than by direct inner compulsion. In the third generation, organization develops and institutions are established. The need is seen for schools to pass on the faith of the fathers. Colleges are established. Members have to be exhorted to live up to the standards, while at the same time the standards of membership are being lowered. Does this sound familiar? The group becomes lax about disfellowshipping non-practicing members. Missionary zeal cools off. There is more concern over public relations. Leaders study methods or study methods of propagating their faith, sometimes employing extrinsic rewards as motivation for service by the members. Youth question why they are different from others and intermarry with those not of their faith. Boy, if this isn't true, just by what we see. By the way, this discourse was given October 15th of 1978. In the fourth generation, there is much machinery. The number of administrators increases, while the number of workers at the grassroots becomes proportionately less. Great church councils are held to define doctrine. More schools, universities, and seminaries are established. These go to the world for accreditation and tend to become secularized. There is a re-examination of positions and modernizing of methods. Attention is given to contemporary culture with an interest in the arts, music, architecture, literature. The movement seeks to become relevant to contemporary society by becoming involved with popular causes. Service has become formal. The group enjoys complete acceptance by the world. The sect has become a church. Brethren and sisters, this must never happen to the Seventh-day Adventist church. I'm reading him, not, this is not me. This will not happen to the Seventh-day Adventist church. 
This is not just another church. It is God's church. But you are the men and women sitting in this sanctuary this morning on whom God is counting to assure that it does not happen. Already, brethren and sisters, see, he could see the handwriting on the wall. Already, brethren and sisters, there are subtle forces that are beginning to stir. Regrettably, there are those in the church who belittle the inspiration of the total Bible, who scorn the first 11 chapters of Genesis, who question the spirit of prophecy, short chronology of the age of the earth, and who subtly, and not so subtly, attack the spirit of prophecy. There are some who point to the reformers and contemporary theologians as the source and the norm of Seventh-day Adventist doctrine. There are those who allegedly are tired of the hack need phrases of Adventism. There are those who wish to forget the standards of the church we love. There are those who covet and would court the favor of the evangelicals. Those who would throw off the mantle of a peculiar people and those who would go the way of the secular materialistic world. Is this describing pretty much what has happened? Yes or no? You know it. You know it is. Fellow leaders, beloved brethren and sisters, don't let it happen. I appeal to you as earnestly as I know how this morning. Don't let it happen. I appeal to Andrews University, to the seminary, to Loma Linda University. University don't let it happen. We are not Seventh-day Anglicans nor Seventh-day Lutherans. We are Seventh-day Adventists. This is God's last church with God's last message. You are the men and women, the leaders whom God is counting on to keep the Seventh-day Adventist church, God's remnant church, the church God has destined to triumph. Well, there's a second page that I'm not going to read because I think you already have the gist of what Ellen White, uh, Ellen White says and what Robert Pearson has to say in this passage. Folks, we are living in the time of the shaking. Do you believe that? And Ellen White makes it clear that there are three things that are going to cause the shaking, and I'll finish with this. She says, first of all, people conforming to the worldly standard. Secondly, false doctrines and false teachings. And whoever the devil cannot get out by conforming that person to the world or by false doctrines and teachings, you will have the third method, and that is persecution. And when the shaking is over, only those who have heard God's word and have obeyed God's word, the law and the testimony, will be found faithful when the winds of strife blow and the waters of the overwhelming flood, flood the earth. May we study God's word and pray such as we have never prayed before and witness to others such as we have never witnessed before. And may we attend church more faithfully than ever before and use our resources for God's kingdom such as we have never before because the ship is going to reach the port and I pray to God that we will be on. Father in heaven, we thank you for having been with us in our study this morning. I ask, Father, that you will help us to renew that commitment, sitting down and struggling with your word, studying your word, praying, witnessing, being faithful in spiritual gifts, being faithful in our tithes and offerings, church attendance. Lord, light a fire under us. For we want to be ready for the time of trouble and for the coming of Jesus. I ask, Lord, that you will be with each person gathered here. Speak to each conscience through the voice of your Spirit. I thank you for hearing my prayer, for I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.